So this week, no one sent me questions to answer on content of last week, which is a little concerning. Um, I generally assume you do not understand everything in the readings or in the lectures, but I'm not receiving questions. If you have questions, please send them. I'm going to jump right into discussing this week's readings on functionalism. Functionalism might seem rather complicated, confusing to you. Take some time to try and understand it. Read the readings closely, particularly the photo. I'm not going to go in the order that the readings occurred in the book. Rather, I'm going to start with the photo. And Fodor wants to give us something of a history of theories of mind going from Descartes to his day when that was written, I don't know, maybe 1981, something like that. And there's a development of theories of mind based on problems found with a extant theory of mind. So we move from dualism to behaviorism based on a problem with the dualist theory of mind. Largely the measure here that we're looking at to see whether or not a theory of mind is problematic is whether or not it underwrites nomological generalizations. Nomological generalizations are something very much like laws of science. Laws of science allow us to do two main things. They now allow us to explain and to predict. Explain occurrences that we observe, predict future observant, uh, occurrences of behavior particularly. And so if we develop a theory of mind, a science of the mind, based on an understanding of the mind and mind-body interaction, we want that to be something like our best science. Well, our best science is physics, and so we want the laws of the mind to be something like the laws of physics. The laws of physics can't explain what we see physically. They can't predict what we will see physically. And so, when we're testing a theory of mind, part of what we're concerned with is whether or not it can deliver what physics delivers. Only for the mind, can it underwrite these nomological generalizations? And dualism gave us an account of the nature of mind, it gave us an account of the nature of body, said something about their interaction, but could not actually explain how mind caused changes in body, or how body caused changes in mind. And so we have a lack of explanation. We have an account of mind, we have an account of body, but we have a failure to explain how mind and body could interact. And so we have a failure to generate nomological generalizations, laws of mind-body interaction. So from this, we move to another theory of mind. We see a problem with our current theory of mind, dualism, so we need something different to try and give us this science of the mind that can underwrite laws. And Fodor says, well, after dualism, we move to behaviorism. Behaviorism says, well, we can get around this problem of mind-body interaction by accounting, get rid of the mind as a mental thing altogether. All we have are physical things. And we can explain why a behavior occurs by appealing to past behavior and influences from the environment. Why did this person get scared when they saw the little fluffy rabbit? Well, because in the past, they were given a little fluffy rabbit and a loud horn was blown behind their head, startling them. They learned an association between a fluffy rabbit and the fear response. I've explained why they behave a certain way. I can predict well, what's going to happen when this person or this dog that Pavlov had a hold of, what's going to happen when I ring a bell in front of this dog? Well, I predict the dog's going to salivate. Predict that, ring the bell, see the dog salivates. I have, it seems, a science of the mind that can underwrite nomological generalizations. It can explain, it can predict. It succeeds where dualism fails. However, there's a set of circumstances it does not succeed in, namely mental-mental causation. Because behaviorism looks only at behavior and the environment, anything that happens purely in the head, purely locked within the black box, I think about, well, would I rather eat pizza or hamburger tonight? I think, I think, I think, I decide I'm tired and I want to go to bed and not eat anything. 
I had mental events, mental properties, thoughts that led to other mental events, but nothing in behavior, right? And so behaviorism cannot account for this. It cannot explain those times in which we have thoughts that lead to other thoughts but are disconnected from behavior. So behaviorism fails to underwrite nomological generalizations in certain cases. And from that, we get a movement to identity theory. And identity theory, it said, well, can explain these mental, mental causal cases because it says the mental is identical to the physical. And so to say there's mental, mental causation is just to say there's physical, physical causation. What happened when I thought about what I wanted for supper and then came to the realization I don't want anything for supper and go to bed instead? From the movement from what do I want from supper, all the thoughts in between, to I don't want anything from su for supper, mental state causing mental state causing mental state causing mental state. Well, mental states are only physical states, so there was a brain state leading to another brain state, leading to another brain state. And therefore, identity theory can explain mental, mental causation, can predict mental, mental causation, at least once we know enough about neurology, can study brain states finally enough. And so, that's the transition from dualism to behaviorism, from behaviorism to identity theory. But then supposedly there's a problem for identity theory. Now remember what we studied when we studied identity theory was type identity theory. And the reason we did that is because it was thought that we need to be able to say there is a mental type, say the experience of pain, and that's identical to a physical type, C fibers firing. This allows us to say something like, if someone has their C fibers firing, they will holler, ouch. That's a nomological generalization, or it is a prediction based on a nomological generalization. What was not acceptable, what we did not look at, was token identity theory, which is a very weak claim, which says whenever there is a mental event, as opposed to a type of mental event, there is a corresponding identical physical event. But this, it seems, is not going to allow us to generate, generate nomological generalizations. We need to be able to say when any certain kind of thing happens, then something else of that kind will happen. If all that's true is that when there is a mental event, there is a corresponding physical event, then I'm not going to be able to make explanations or predictions. What happens in my head when I feel <clears throat> pain here and now might be very different than <clears throat> from what happens in my head when I'm in pain in a few minutes or what happens when you're in pain. But if this is true, then what we have is if you experience pain here and now or if you experience pain in five minutes or if you, you experience pain as opposed to me, if someone else experiences pain, if the pain is of a sharp type as opposed to a dull type, then this will happen, or that will happen, or this will happen, or that will happen. And that's not the form that laws take. That's not going to allow us to explain or predict anything. If you say, well, why did that person yell out? I'm going to have to say, well, it's either the case that their C fibers C1 through Cn were firing in a such and such way, or some other C fibers were firing in such and such a way, or these certain neurons were doing such and such thing, or, and so on and so on and so on, and that's not an explanation, at least not the kind of explanation we're after in science. And so the claim is that token identity theory, even if true, as an ontological claim, for any mental event, there is an identical, corresponding, determining physical event. If the physical events cannot be grouped into a kind based on similarity and correspond to a group of mental things grouped together by a similarity, then we're not going to be able to give anything as far as an explanation, a law-like explanation. 
We don't, in science, say that, well, the fire started because of this particular case here and now, name the entire physical state of the world. No, we make abstractions to some extent and say the reason there was a fire is because there was a fuel and there was an ignition source and there was a lack of water. Now, the particular fuel, the particular ignition source, the lack of moisture, a lack of water, those could have a certain degree of variation among them. There was a Bunsen burner, there was a match dropped, there was a lightning strike all kinds of different ignition sources, but as a type fire, they're caused by a type of thing, or a series of types of things. And that's what we're after. We need these similarities between the physical types and the mental types in order to underwrite nomological generalizations. But it seems that there's a problem for identity theory. Identity theory succeeded where behaviorism didn't in giving us law-like generalizations. Behaviorism succeeded where dualism didn't, but identity theory, the claim goes, has a problem, and that seems that there's multiple ways to realize a given mental state. Voter sort of nods at this, and we'll look at this more, but we might say that, you know, pain in me and pain in you, or pain in me and pain in the dog and pain in a mollusk, these are all very different sorts of things, and if there's more than one way, more than one kind of very different physical state that could underwrite this mental state of pain, then what I have is something like, rather than um, mental state of pain, if and only a physical state of C fibers firing, that's a good nomological generalization. But if I have instead, mental state pain, if and only if, physical state C fibers firing in humans, or a physical state of D fibers firing in dogs, or physical state of M fibers firing in mollusks, and so on and so on and so on. This is not the form laws of science take, so says the objection, and therefore Type identity theory, if there are cases like this, there are mental states that do not correspond to nice, neat groups of physical things, then identity theory fails to give us nomological generalizations. Another objection that may not come out as clearly is, and it's maybe more clear in the token identity case, is that if I tell you, well, why did that person yell ouch? Well, they yelled ouch because they were in pain, and by that I mean because there were C fibers firing right here, right now. That explains something, but it doesn't explain to me why C fibers firing are associated with saying ouch behavior. I need some sort of a causal explanation, a historical explanation. Behaviorism gives us that. It says the reason that you're afraid of the fluffy bunny is because of associations from your past. Identity theory does not give us that. Functionalism is supposed to step in and it's supposed to give us the mental mental explanation that identity theory can and behaviorism can't and give us this sort of relational account of why a certain physical event is associated with a certain mental event. Behaviorism can do that. Identity theory can't. So functionalism is supposed to step in and give us the virtues of behaviorism, the virtues of identity theory, without the downfalls of either one of them. And there you go. There's Fodor's account of the transition from dualism to behaviorism, from behaviorism to identity theory, from identity theory to functionalism. And then, briefly, he talks about, well, maybe the easiest way to understand what functionalism is, right? I've told you what it's supposed to do for us, but what exactly is it? Well, it is, by analogy, functionalism says that mental states are software, whereas identity theory says that mental states are hardware, right? A mental state, say, an experience of pain, just is a physical state in your brain. Functionalism says no. That would be to identify the mental state with hardware. Mental state is identified with software, and software can be realized under any 
number of different physical realizations. If this is the case, then I could explain pain behavior, mental experiences of pain, even if they're realized in different ways in the world, a different way in my brain than in your brain, than in the dog's brain, than in the mollusk's brain. I can still explain underwrite nomological generalizations based on the fact that pain, the mental experience of pain, is a function of a state of the software, not the hardware. And so you get Fodor discussing a Turing machine, and a Turing machine is supposed to give us an account of sort of what is meant by functionalism. Turing machines are substrate neutral. They can be realized in any number of different ways. So a Turing machine has a tape. The tape is infinite, so it can perform an infinite number of functions. It has a reading head. It can move that head back and forth. It has a writing head. And so if we have a cell on our tape that says, Two and a cell on our tape that says plus, and a cell on our tape that says two, and a cell on our tape that says equals, then we could have a Turing machine with a certain program. And the program would say something like this. We start here, our reading head, and it says if you're in base state and you're observing a number, move to the right. If you're in base state and you're observing a plus, Move to the left and move into state S, where state S means you're going to run a sum function. If you're in state S and you're observing it two, move to the right two spaces and go into state S2, where S2 would be a list of the sums of 2 plus n. Right. If you're in state S2 and you're observing a 2 go into state 4, right? so holding to ready to do something with the number 4 and move to the right. If you're in state n for any number and you're observing an equals, then move to the right and write down n4. So what I have there is some specific constraints on the hardware use have to have a way to get input, have to have a way to give output, and have a program to tell me what to do, how to transition from the input to the output. This right here could be done with a machine ran hydraulically. I could have pistons. I could have humans do it like was just done. I could do it electronically. The input could be visual, it could be oral, it could be in terms of a punch card, and so on. If I have a simple program, I could have that program on a punch card. I could have that program on a cassette tape. I could have that program on a floppy disk, on a CD, on a DVD, on a thumb drive, and so on. The physical realization of the software is not what's at hand, not what we're concerned with. The mental state is identified with the program itself. All the things I did here that said, if you're in such and such state, then do such and such activity. A mental state is that kind of a program. That's the claim of functionalism. And so early on, in one of the first, second lecture, I talked about a production sheet. A production sheet's a series of if-then claims that says, if you want to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, get peanut butter, get jelly, get a knife, get a plate, get bread, and then so on. Go into the next state, go into the next state, go into the next state. Production sheets can be ran by Turing machines. And are supposed to be a way to realize artificial intelligence to give mental states to machines. All right, so there's some idea of what functionalism is, what its claims are, why we have functionalism as a mental theory, a theory of mind, because it's supposed to deliver us things with regards to nomological generalizations that identity theory cannot. All right, so move on to Putnam. 
Putnam says identity theory is wrong, not because it in and of itself is wrong, but because there's a better theory. That better theory is functionalism. And in making the claim, he essentially picks up, goes into more detail for that objection that Fodor makes, that I mentioned with Fodor. That is, it seems that there are multiple, vastly different physical states that underwrite a single mental state, mental property. And Putnam, in going into detail, he said, well, look, it seems if we look at behavior, that all kinds of different animals exhibit pain behavior, and therefore we might want to say they have mental state of being in pain. Humans have this, reptiles have this, mollusks, an octopus, exhibits pain behavior. But, and this is the claim Putnam's making, these are claims that are in objection to identity theory, if all of these things, all of these different kinds of animals are in pain, there has to be, for type identity theory to succeed, a single physical state common to humans, reptiles, and mollusks. But it seems very unlikely that there is any such thing. Human brains are vastly different than reptile brains, are vastly different than mollusks' brains. So then we would have something like this, you are in the mental state of pain if it only is such and such for me, such and such for dogs, such and such for reptiles, such and such for mollusks, and this is not the form of a nomological generalization. Putnam says what is needed for type identity theory is there needs to exist, a, for any given mental state, a single physical realization of that mental state. If a mental state can be realized in two different ways physically, and here the, the claim different ways is a type claim, right? So we're going to group different specific token physical realizations together based on similarities. But if we end up with two different groups because of different similarities, different evolutionary history for mollusks and humans, different kinds of fibers, uh, nerve fibers firing, <clears throat> then we say we have different physical realizations. But this is supposed to, says Putnam, be the counterexample to type identity theory. If there is a mental event with two different physical realizations, two different type physical realizations, then identity theory fails. What identity theory needs for any given mental property is a single for any type of mental property, it needs a single physical type of realization. And each mental type needs its own physical type of realization. That is, every mental type has a physical type it corresponds to, and every physical type, or no mental type has, no two mental types correspond to any one given physical type, right? They don't talk as much about that case, but both of those should hold true. So the claim goes, if type identity theory is true, or if type identity theory is going to underwrite nomological generalizations, and these are two different claims. One has to do with an ontological claim. Is it the case that every type of mental event corresponds to a type of physical event? Every type of mental state corresponds to a type of physical state. Is it true that every specific mental state, mental event, corresponds to a physical state or physical event? It's an ontological claim about the nature of mind. But then there's another claim about being able to explain and predict behavior, which is a methodological consideration. It's not clear here whether Putnam's objecting to the ontological truth of identity theory, or if he's concerned with the fact that if there is multiple, multiple realizability of a mental state, that undermines the ability of identity theory to generate nomological generalizations. There are two different sorts of objections, and I'll talk more about this in a minute when we get to the church list. Putnam then says, well, because this is the nature of nomological generalizations, as I've said, he's been using this in the background, Moving to a disjunctive sort of law is not an option. A disjunctive sort of law is when it says, well, if A is the case, or B is the case, or C is the case, then D. 
or then D or E. Right? We have a disjunct in there. And the claim is that, well, that's not an option. It's obviously objectionable. Putnam has a really famous article against um, reductionism in which he claims that disjunction causes a problem for reductionism. The ability to say that a mental or a higher level state reduces to a physical or lower level state. If the lower level state is actually a disjunctive state, could have more than one realization, then we can't make that reduction. It's a famous paper. Does not mean that that paper is right. I'm going to leave that alone for now and talk about qualia. Putnam mentions qualia, talks about the various realizations of qualia, mentions qualia inversion. What is qualia? Well, qualia is a plural. <clears throat> qualia, the plural of quale, which is the qualitative property of a mental experience. Now, if I see red, something happens. There is the, the physical fact of my eyes, cones changing in my eyes, neurons firing, there are the reflective properties of the red thing in the world, and so on. There's also mental things occurring. One of the mental things that occurs is I'm likely to say that thing looks like a ripe tomato. But also, there's some kind of experience had. There's something it's like to see a red thing, and that experience is different than what it's like to see a green thing. That's what it's like is the qualia. Pain has a qualia different than tickle, say. And so part of the concern here with all of this is accounting for qualitative experiences. The qualities we have mentally when we're in a given mental state. Mental state of pain, lots of things true of that mental state, only one of which is its qualitative truth. Right? And so in come Lewis. Lewis has a case of mad pain and Martian pain. And these are maybe complicated ways to talk about qualia inversion. But if we've taken that functionalism, or well, identity theory has succeeded where behaviorism and dualism can't, maybe it can succeed in other places, namely with qualitative experiences, giving an, an account of qualitative experiences. If you can give true nomological generalizations, you can tell me about a given physical state in my head and predict from that my qualitative experience, possibly. Then the question is, well, can identity theory do this? Can functionalism do this? Lewis steps in, he has two examples. He said, well, there's mad pain. Imagine a madman. Madman experiences pain, and by experience pain, we don't mean a behaviorist sort of thing, where you're likely to say, ouch, you're likely to remove your hand from the pain-producing thing. Rather, this person has the qualitative experience that you and I have when we experience pain. That unpleasantness, the sharpness, the what have you, the way it feels for us to have pain, when this madman has pain, it has different functional associations. It leads this person to think better, to cross their leg, to snap their fingers. It does not lead them to say ow, it does not lead them to remove their hand, and it's not produced by touching fire or being stabbed with a pen. The qualitative experience of having pain, the quality of pain for the madman, occurs at a different time than it occurs for us. It's associated with different inputs, different outputs than it is for us. And so this is essentially a complicated case of qualia inversion. Qualia inversion is if we take the the most obvious example is the color wheel. You take the color wheel and invert it or twist it to the side a little bit so that the qualitative experience I have when looking at grass, say, is the qualitative experience you have when you look at a ripe tomato. I have the experience when looking at a green thing that you have when looking at a red thing. Now, if this were the case, if this could occur, 
you and I would behave exactly the same. We would say, oh, look, that grass is green. Why? Because you've learned to associate the word green with an experience of seeing green, having a green quality experience. I've learned to say the word green when having what you experience as red, that red type of experience. You would say that grass looks like uh, a watermelon, similar in color to a watermelon. I would say the same thing because I experience a watermelon in the way you experience a ripe tomato. I see what you see when you see red. Now, the question is, well, is colleagues qualia inversion possible? If so, we have something of a problem because we need to explain not just input-output as per behaviorism, but everything that goes on. My experience itself, if we can't explain qualia, then qualia are something epiphenomenal. Right? The experience themselves divorced from the association we make with those experiences, to words, to inputs, to outputs, the experiences themselves are non-causal. It doesn't matter whether I experience green as green, that is, have the experience you have when you experience green, or if I experience something green in the way that you experience something red. It's not going to make any difference with regards to input-output. Another case Lewis talks about is Martian pain. You have a Martian, Martian when something hot touches the Martian's body, when something heavy touches the Martian's body, the Martian says, ow, tries to pull their hand away. But the Martian's body is not made up of C fibers or neurons at all, but rather hydraulics, hydraulic systems. And now the claim of Lewis is that a true theory of mind ought to be able to say both the madman and the Martian are in pain. The madman's in pain because the madman has that qualitative experience that is pain. The Martian is in pain because the functional input outputs are exactly the same. And the Martian also has the qualitative experience. Right? of being in pain. This might be confusing to us because the Martian just is hydraulics, but the claim is nonetheless that the Martian has. And the reason that this can be made is because remember that pain is a software issue and can be realized by any different top number of types of hardware. And so Lewis says, well, if the identity theory can say that the madman is in pain because C fibers are firing in that person. But the behaviorist can't account for the madman being in pain because the input and output are different. The input was not one of being poked by a pen and the output was not one of saying out. The Martian pain, the behaviorist can explain the Martian was poked with a pen and did say ow, so the behaviorist can account for the Martian being in pain. The identity theorist cannot because there are no C fibers firing. And what we want is functionalism to step in and explain both cases. And the claim is that, well, it does succeed at this. It succeeds at this because the functional inputs and outputs and the association with qualitative experience, if we combine these two and think functionalism can combine these two, then we're able to explain the madman as being in pain because of having the qualitative experience and the Martian as being in pain because having the qualitative experience and the functional input and output relationships. We could also do it, presumably, if the Martian did not have the qualitative experience of pain. But the real case, it seems, turns in the madman case and whether or not we can make sense of inverted qualia. And so the church will step in <coughs> and they say, and the, the reason that the mad pain case is 
the real test is because, well, it seems like our nomological generalizations work in the Martian case, the behaviorist nomological generalizations work, and there's something very similar between functionalism and behaviorism in that they're both concerned with historical input-output relationships. The Martian says Al when poked with a pen because the Martian has learned to or because the Martian's machine body has evolved to protect itself by saying Al and removing its hand. We've explained why the Al occurs given the input of a poke of a pen. But can we predict the qualitative experience of the madman? Can we explain the madman's behavior. And part of that can be done by saying, well, the qualitative experience of being in pain for the madman was associated with different things, learning to work, uh, being motivated to work, producing good work, as opposed to protecting his body. And so we can get something like an experience, uh, an explanation there, but can we get a prediction of the experience, the mental experience. Right? So what we're supposed to be able to do with functionalism is explain the mental, mental causation. And it seems like maybe there's something missing in this case. So the inverted qualia case is the real test of functionalism. And so the churchlands step in, and the churchlands are doing a number of things, one of which, well, they're challenging Putnam, they're challenging Fodor, and they're also answering to this inverted qualia challenge. And they say, well, we can explain inverted qualia, how they would be possible, by noting that we don't start by experiencing things mental and then group terms. Use, we don't learn our language based on the mental qualitative experiences. That's not the order of development. Rather, we group terms or group experiences under a term based on their functional relations. So they say, imagine pain. Pain is not one kind of experience. Pain can be sharp. It can be dull. It can be gradual. It can be sudden. It can be deep. It can be soft. The pain when you touch something really cold versus the pain when you touch something really hot versus the pain when your hand is being crushed, versus the pain of when your hand is being stabbed. These are very different from a qualitative standpoint. The reason we call them all pain is because of the input-output associations. The input is some sort of danger to the body. The output is some sort of maintenance to prevent damage to the body. And so we come to group all of these different qualitative experiences under one term based on functional considerations. And so part of what they're doing here is to note that if we go back to this, we notice that really, you know, we thought that this was a problem, this disjunctive form was a problem because that can't underwrite nomological generalizations. We had a single thing here, the mental experience of pain, and then we associated it with this big disjunct, maybe one different disjunct for each animal in the world that can't experience pain, and that's not what laws are like. And they say, part of what the Churchlands are saying is, well, look, this is not a unity here. There is not a single thing that is mental pain. Rather, there is the mental experience of pain when you touch fire, or the mental experience of pain when you touch ice, or the mental experience of pain when you're being crushed, or the mental experience of pain when you're being stabbed. You have those mental experiences, one company of pain, and by having the mental experience of pain, I mean either you have the experience of being burned, or being frozen, or being crushed, or being stabbed, or, 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 if and only if you have the physical state of blah, 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 blah. 
So unless what we end up wanting to do with our mental laws is come out and say, well, if you have the mental experience of pain by being burned, of fire, if and only if, and then we go on to say the physical experience of sea fiber, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and now what we've done is divide pain up. But the problem is that, you know, there's not even one thing that is the physical experience. I'm sorry, the mental experience of being in pain from fire. Slightly warm, hot water, put my hand under hot water, put my hand in boiling oil, put a flame to my hand, a hot coal. There are intensities, there are different areas that are experienced the pain. Each one of those is going to have a different physical realization. So what we're doing is putting pressure to move us into the direction of token identity theory. Right? And this is a problem because token identity theory is not supposed to be able to deliver us these nomological generalizations. They give us law-like relationships, but they're not generalizations. They say this mental experience happened because of this physical experience, but I can't tell you anything about what's going to happen in the future or explain the developmental history of why this mental experience is associated with this physical experience. All I can do is say that they're identical. That's law-like, but I can't generalize to underwrite explanations or predictions. And so this seems to be a problem. But really, if we were okay in the first place with saying, well, we were trying to explain the mental experience of pain, then why do we have to be all that concerned with saying that there's a disjunctum here? If this were itself a disjunction, why be concerned with this being a disjunction? And so with quality inversion, I could say, well, to say that to see something red is to have any number of given things true in the world, right? There is something with a certain physical structure that reflects light in a certain way. The light is a certain way. My eyes are a certain way. Certain things happen with the cones and rods in my eyes firing in my uh, optic nerve firing in my brain. All of these things are physical truths of the world when I am appeared to by something red. Other things are true mentally, I'm likely to say that thing looks like a ripe tomato, I'm likely to say low red, I'm likely to have a qualitative experience of a certain sort. Well, if we're going to fill in these disjunctions, allow disjunction, then that qualitative experience of a certain sort could be, for me, the experience of the same sort of mental experience you have when you see green. Or, in you, it could be the same sort of mental experience you uh, most have when seeing red. We can allow these disjunctions and underwrite laws if we allow disjunctive laws. And so there's a question of whether or not, and this is sort of basic to functionalism and the claims, the Putnam claim, Putnam argument, the photo argument, that there's a problem with identity theory Functionalism succeeds where identity theory doesn't because identity theory would have to have these sort of disjunctive laws and that's not the way laws are. There's a question here of whether that's even true. And I will say, well, no, it's not. Um, one thing in the background of Fodor and Putnam's reasoning is that, well, laws are based on natural kinds. Kinds, groups of things in the world with certain similarities that we put into a single group. That's a kind. Natural kinds are things grouped together by their nature as opposed to by us. Right? Games, we can group things together. Anything in the world, you can show it to me and say, is this a game? I can say yes, I can say no, and I'll get it right. That is, there will be agreement between my answers and your answers a huge proportion of the time but it's thought that games are not a natural kind. Whereas other things are supposedly natural kinds, namely, well, at one example of a natural kind oftentimes is a biological species. I think I'm in the vast minority of philosophers when I say not only are there not natural kinds, but I cannot for the life of me understand what a natural kind could be. 
I don't think that kinds exist in the world. I think particulars exist in the world. Kinds exist when we apply our minds to the world. And so this whole idea that there are laws based on natural kinds and only that kind of law counts to underwrite a nomological generalization, that's a Grinsberg grip. It is something like an ideal case that's never actual. And really, all laws of even physics are disjunctive to some degree, or their generalizations, idealizations, the specific realization of which are disjunctive. And so I don't buy this claim, and the churchlands don't buy this claim, that laws have to connect to natural kinds. And this is important because you see, well, if pain in humans is one thing, connected with one physical state, pains in mollusks or something else, we have very different things here. And these kinds, we're only jerry-rigging, we're only putting together because we want to call them similar. They're not similar in and of themselves by their nature. But there is no such thing. So I say, maybe so the church on say. All kinds are merely put together by us. And they're put together by us if they're useful, if they're useful for underwriting nomological generalizations, making predictions and explanations. And to call pain in me and pain in a mollusk of the same kind does allow me to predict what happens to the mollusk. And if I understand the different physical realizations, also allows me to predict or explain what happens physically in the mollusk, even if that's not C-fiber fiber. And so the claim that, if it's true, type identity theory does not underwrite nomological generalizations based on natural kinds, that is not an objection to the ontological truth of identity theory. A number of times it was said that, well, functionalism, because of this substrate neutral claim, functionalism says mental states are software and therefore can be realized any number of different ways through hydraulics, through pistons, through electronics, through neurons, or through immaterial objects. So it was claimed a number of times that functionalism is consistent with dualism the software that is a mental state could be realized by an immaterial object. This is not to say that it could explain mental physical causation if that were the case. It could, however, give us an account of mind in an immaterial world, idealism. Whether or not it could remove all the problems of dualism is not clear, but what is supposed to be clear is that it's not committed to a specific ontology because Mental states are software, software is multiply realizable. Okay, but if that's true, functionalism is also consistent with identity theory, the claim that mental states just are physical states, or rather, the ontology is purely physical, reduction. Mental states are software, but they always depend on physical things. Um, the way to tell apart functionalism and type identity theory is not going to be ontologically, it seems. Because functionalism could be true if all that exists is physical. Functionalism could be true if all that exists is mental. Rather, the reason that all this turn is made for nomological generalizations has to do with which is more useful, identity theory or functionalism. Putnam says he does not reject identity theory because it's false, but because there's a better theory, a better, better theory in underwriting nomological generalizations. And so, the claim should not be understood that token identity theory is false, rather it's not useful. It's not the case that nomological generalizations are not disjunctive, 
It's not the case that laws of science are not disjunctive. It's not the case that the laws of physics are not disjunctive. It's rather that if they become massively disjunctive, they're not useful. And so there's a question of degree. How much disjunct do we want to allow? Here we have token identity theory, which says that for any given instance of a mental state, name every single time, anything has experienced pain at a given time, millions, millions, billions, nearly infinite instances of the mental state pain, each one is listed one or two or three or four or five or six. Those things, if and only if, and then we list every single physical state that occurred during those mental states. That's not useful because it tells me one of nearly innumerable things occurred, and from that I can predict that one of nearly innumerable things occurred. That's not very useful. So token identity theory is all the way down here on this side. Type identity theory, if we could have a nice, neat, natural kind, mental experience of pain is a natural kind. It occurs if and only if another natural kind, a physical natural kind occurs, see fiber firing, then I can predict. That person has C fiber firing, that person is going to jump and say, ow. Okay. Highly useful. But in reality, this is an idealization. This could be ontologically true, methodologically useless. This could be methodologically highly useful, ontologically false. There's no such thing as natural kinds. Laws do not really take that form. And so the question is, where in between token identity theory, type identity theory of this natural kind sort, this Grinsbegriff that does not really exist, where between fully disjunctive and not at all disjunctive, do functionalism and type identity, type identity theory occur? How disjunctive are each of them? If we end up saying that functionalism is the least disjunctive, and it's the least disjunctive because it doesn't depend on, say, the way it's realized, the substrate that realizes it, then good for functionalism. Functionalism succeeds where type identity theory does not with regards to methodology, with regards to its ability to underwrite nomological generalizations, give explanations, give predictions. That does not mean type identity theory, type identity theory is ontologically false. Okay? So there's a confusion that occurs in the literature. There's lots of methodological argument going on, and it's made to look like it's a claim of falsity. Either token identity theory gives us a false account of mind and its relationship to body, as opposed to it gives us a not very useful way to predict and explain mental events. And so we find, actually, as an example, uh, lots of research done in neurology with the physical realization of mental events, and you can show a monkey, you can strap a monkey's head down so that it cannot move its head, can still move its eyes, and show it uh, a series of progressively moving scrolling horizontal lines or vertical lines, and you get something very precise that happens in the monkey's brain. It's horizontal scrolling lines, very small area of neurons fires. We can map this out, we can draw circles around that area. If it's vertical scrolling, different part of the, of the brain fires, different set of neurons fires. And it's thought, oh, well, look, there, mental experience of seeing horizontal scrolling lines in a monkey corresponds to this set of neurons firing. But in reality, no, it doesn't, because what happens is if you change the monkey's head, tilt it sideways, tilt it back, if you change the lighting, then you get a different set of neurons firing. And so what we see is while there is a very tight correlation, a one-to-one -one correlation between a mental experience, presumably, and a physical state in the brain, it depends on all the details, the entire context there. So for the monkey, in a monkey brain, 
and remember this is potentially only one disjunct of all the things that see scrolling horizontal lines, in the monkey brain, such and such species of monkey, seeing horizontal lines at this angle, in these lighting conditions, before or after being eaten, all kinds of factors come in, then it corresponds to this neural state. Or alternately, seeing the horizontal lines, having the mental experience of horizontal line scrolling, corresponds to this set of neural firing, or this set of neural firing, or this set of neural firing, or this set of neural firing. Of neural firing. There is a nice identity correlation there, but the identity is between something very complicated in the world, the experience with all the context roll in, with a specific mental property, a specific set of neurons firing. And so even there, with a very simple case of just seeing horizontal lines scrolling and a small set of neurons, we get vastly disjunctive relationship. And that's not even anything like processing something complicated like heartbreak. My heart feels broken. That has to do with all kinds of things in the world. It has to do with emotions, complicated, intense emotions involving not just my brain, but my adrenal system and all kinds of things. And so my heartbreak, your heartbreak, etc. The heartbreak I feel today and the heartbreak I feel in the morning. These things are going to be vastly disjunctive more vastly disjunctive than the monkey brain. And this is the reality we face. And if we think that all laws have to be based on natural kinds to underwrite nomological generalizations, then we just give up the possibility of a mind science. But of course we don't because we understand that this idea that laws of science have to be based on natural kinds is just an idealization. And reality, in reality, the laws of science, even the simplest laws of physics, are disjunctive. When we deal with more complicated systems like neuro, uh, meteorological systems, neurological systems, biological systems, our laws are going to be messier. But the fact that they have a disjunct in them does not mean they're not laws of science. And so we have to separate out the claim that functionalism is methodologically better than identity theory because it gives us nicer, neater laws that better explain and better predict with less verbiage, say. That claim, from the ontological claim, that identity theory is false. Since functionalism is substrate neutral, it doesn't make a claim about whether physicalism is true or whether idealism is true or whether dualism is true. We have to adjudicate these ontological disputes on other grounds. Then within the methodological consideration, there's the additional issue of whether we really think, given the fact that we are going to countenance disjunctive laws, whether we really believe that functionalism is better at delivering laws than identity theory. Functionalism itself is not going to be able to deliver us disjunctionless laws based on only natural kinds. Software, I take it, are not natural kinds at all. Input-output relationships are not natural kinds at all. Nothing's a natural kind, but I don't think anyone takes those to be candidates for natural kinds. And now a final sort of dangler mystery from the churchlands, and they say, well, look, what about someone who had the same input-output relations as us? Pope with a pen, they say, ow, remove their hand. Every single input-output relation is just like everyone else's. Ceteris paribus but they lack qualia altogether. There's nothing qualitative about them. Are such beings possible? These are zombies. They're philosophical zombies. They have nothing going on qualitatively upstairs. And they want to say, no, those things are not possible. Others, um, namely David Chalmers, who I believe we'll read at some point, says that zombies are not only possible, but actually existent. 
Your neighbor could be a zombie. He could lack qualitative experience. We'd never be able to know this. Churches want to say zombies are not possible, but if they want to say that zombies are not possible, then they have to say that anything with these input-output relations that are the same as ours have mental experiences, qualitative mental experiences. But if this is the case, and functions can be realized substrate neutrally, something with nothing but hydraulics, that respond to inputs the same way that we do, we would have to say that that thing, that hydraulic system, has qualitative experiences. And so, functionalism leads us with a decision to make. Do we want to allow into our ontology zombies, things that are physically identical to us, with the same input-output relationships as us, and lack qualitative mental experiences, do we say those things are in our ontology, they exist? Or do we want to say they're not? And if we say they're not, then we have to allow hydraulic systems with the same input-output relations as us that do have qualitative experiences. In fact, they have to have qualitative experiences. So functionalism leaves us with that choice. If we want to rule out both cases, it seems we need something other than functionalism. Complicated week. I do expect you have questions. I would like to see those questions.